David Smith here with one more flip classroom math video in the rain. Three tips before we start. First, you can speed up or slow down the playback if that helps you digest the content. Second, you can pause the video anytime and catch up with your notes. Lastly, you could turn on the captions and watch my words go by on the bottom of the screen. Today's topic covers data and sampling. And so we're gonna first take a look at various types of data and the things we're gonna talk about when we discuss data. And then we're gonna talk about populations and how to sample populations. So this all starts with data. So let's take a look. Discrete data. This is a certain kind of data and it can only be certain fixed values. For example, how many pets do you have at home? You don't have 1.5 pets. You have one or two. You don't have a half of a pet. So think of a couple other examples for discrete data. Okay, so one way to look at discrete data is the number of somethings. So you don't have one half of a sibling or one half of a planet. You have one planet, two planets, or like eight planets or nine planets. So that's one way to look at discrete data. Now there's another one. Think for a second if you come up with something else that's not a number of something, but still it's discrete. It can only be a certain fixed value. Okay, so here's two more types. Undoubtedly, you came up with some different ones. Um, if we roll a die, we can only get a one, two, three, four, five, or a six. We can't roll a four and a half. So that's discrete data. Same thing with coin flips. Can only get a head or a tail. We can't get kind of halfway between the two. And there's numerous examples of other types of discrete data. So if your data is not discrete, then most likely it's continuous. And continuous data can have any value within a range. So for example, the amount of time I can hold my breath. It might be 48.97 seconds. It might be 121.234 seconds. It just depends A, on how long I can hold my breath and what my measurement tool is. But it can fall within a range, but it can be any data within a range. So think about for a minute, like come up with two other types of continuous data. Okay, here's what I came up with. Undoubtedly, you probably came up with a couple other things. So the mass of an object, that's continuous data, and say the distance between two objects, like my two fingers or the distance between Pluto and Mars, something like that. Now, one thing to recognize, and this is kind of a little tip, is that um, continuous data is often expressed with decimals or fractions. And that makes sense, because you can't have a fraction of a person, that's discrete data. You can't have a fraction of a pet, because that's discrete data. So continuous data has decimals and fractions quite often. Two more characteristics about data that concern us. The first one is reliability. So if we go out and collect a bunch of data and then we analyze it and then we come to some conclusions, if we did that process again, use the same collection process, would the data tell us roughly the same thing? If that's not true, then we have some problem with the reliability of our data. We're trying to say something about a population. So if we ask the same question in the same way, two different times and get different conclusions, there's something wrong there, it's not reliable. The second one is, do we have enough data? Is, there, is the quantity enough for us to actually reach a valid conclusion? For example, let's say at your school you wanna find out attitudes about a certain type of music. You go out there and you ask one person, do you like rap? That person says, no, you reach the conclusion that nobody at my school likes rap. Obviously, you did not have enough data to reach that conclusion. Let's dig a little bit closer into unreliable data. And there's two main causes for why data can be unreliable. And missing data is one of the big ones. So the first thing is you could be missing some survey responses. So that means you sent a survey to 50 people, you got 25 back. That means there are 25 people out there who you determined were important sample for your entire population. You didn't get their responses. You don't know what they think. So if you miss something, then your conclusions are gonna be at least incorrect, if not outright wrong. The second one is if you don't record all the data that you need, then you're not gonna have a valid um, pool of data and you won't have a valid conclusion. For example, if you're sampling cars that drive by a road for a 24 hour period, 
but you sleep for eight of those hours, you're not going to have the data from the eight hours that you were asleep. So that's missing data. Finally, data could be lost. Historians will dig back into historical records, grab data out of there, do statistics on it to be able to say things about populations. If half the data for a county was lost in 1885, then that data becomes unreliable because we don't know about half the people that we're trying to say something about. So missing data can really affect the results of your statistical study. So the second cause for unreliable data is data errors. And perhaps the most common is just recording data. Let's say you're out there in a field with your clipboard and your pencil and you're writing stuff down and the wind is blowing and it's raining and you write things down wrong. It's stressful, you write the wrong number, things like that. That happens, we're human beings. So there's errors in recording. Also from instruments, and you could imagine sophisticated instruments that are taking readings like pH or things like that, they might be calibrated incorrectly. So your data is gonna have errors. Now, if you thought hard, I think you'd probably come up with a few more um, data error sources. So before we move on to sampling techniques, I just wanna make this point that many IB students choose some kind of statistical analysis for their IA paper. And so that's why I think the IB puts a lot of emphasis on these introductory parts for our statistics unit. Now, when we get into it, we're gonna do statistics a whole lot more. We're not actually gonna do any of these things, but they're here for you because probably next year when you're a senior and you do your IA at our school, you're, most of our students do statistical studies. All right, let's take a look at this concept of samples and populations. This is at the heart of statistics. If we wanna know something about a large group of people, of course, if we ask everybody in that group the same questions, then we're gonna know definitively what they think as a group. Unfortunately, this is not terribly practical. Often, the group that we wanna talk about has millions of people. We just don't have the time or the resources to ask a million people a set of questions. So what we do is we carefully select a sample, a representative sample of that larger population, ask our questions to that sample, analyze the results, and then generalize those results back up to the large population. And indeed, this is the process of statistics. Um, often polls, like if you're in a political season, you're probably hearing polls reporting that one candidate is ahead of another. This is exactly what polling is doing. Is it sampling a representative, taking a representative sample of a large population, analyzing that and reporting out by generalizing that to the large population. So let's take a look at these two terms. So the population is the large group that we want to learn about. For example, let's just say in this case, we want to learn about Arizona seniors, or we could be asking to learn about dice rolls. So there'd be two different goals here. Perhaps we're, we're asking about seniors. We just want to know what the attitudes of people who are over 65 are, what they think about certain things. So we're going to ask them a bunch of survey questions. Um, dice rolls might be, we're trying to figure out the odds because we're going to go play a dice game with our friends and we want to know kind of what the likelihood of certain types of rolls are going to be. So this one's a very um, human statistics oriented approach. This one's a probability approach, but it applies as well. So our large population is dice rolls, any dice roll. We're curious to know about that. Okay, so as we've mentioned, here's the definition for a sample. It's a subset of a large group that can be used to form conclusions about the large group. Okay, so it's a subset of the large group. So what I want you to do now is pause the video and think about that. What would be a subset of all the Arizona seniors that we could use as a sample to find out about all the Arizona seniors? And then also for dice rolls. So the, the large group of any dice roll on the planet, what would a subset of that be that we could use to analyze to say something about this large group? So pause the video and jot those down. All right, let's see how you did. So what I wrote here for the seniors is I just wrote 1 50th of the seniors in each county. So that gives us a good geographical distribution of all the seniors in Arizona because seniors in Maricopa County might feel differently than seniors in Coconino or in Yavapai County. Now, in reality, we're gonna do a lot more to make sure our seniors are representative because there's a lot more characteristics of seniors that we need to count for. Okay. Dice rolls. 
I want to know about any dice roll on the planet. Let's roll the dice a thousand times. Boom. A thousand dice rolls is our sample for the larger population of any possible dice roll ever. Okay, so let's talk about the techniques employed to gather your sample. And this is super important. If you want your statistical analysis of your data to truly reflect the larger group, the total population that you're studying, your sampling techniques are super important. So let's take a look. So convenience sampling, this is the worst. Let's say I want to learn about people in Phoenix. And so I'm gonna stand on a street corner and just ask everybody who walks by my 10 questions. And I'm gonna do it for two hours in the day. So that's easy for me. I could just do it, take two hours and do it. But the problem is, is that the data I'm gonna gather is gonna to relate to just the people that are walking by in that neighborhood at that time of day. So my data is gonna be skewed towards that smaller group of people and not everybody in Phoenix. So convenience sampling is actually not a super good way to do it. In fact, I think you would only use this technique if you could not use any other techniques. And then when you make your conclusion, you'd have to recognize that because of your sampling method, your data is probably less conclusive than you'd like. All right, let's move on. Random sampling. This has the feeling of being much, much better. Every data point that's out there has an equal chance of being selected. This could be in a classroom full of, of students, say 30 students. You put everybody's name in a hat and you just draw five names at random to ask your survey questions. That would be truly random sampling. You could also go through a city's phone book and just figure out, like, open a page, pick a name, open another page, pick a name, have some kind of technique so that it's truly random. That would be random sampling. Um, systematic sampling is a little bit more systematic. It still has a random element, but it's systematic. So this would mean selecting data points according to a system, i.e. like every 10th student. Or like for example, in the phone book, you could go through the whole phone book and pick every hundredth name in the phone book. Just count along, there's one, we'll call that person, go another hundred, we'll call that person. That's systematic sampling. So you're starting to see we're getting a little bit more deliberate about where we're getting our data from so that it represents, so that it truly represents the population we're trying to talk about. All right, let's take a look at two more techniques. They're getting better and better as we go down this list. So stratified sampling. This would be divide the population into groups based on characteristics like college educated, not college education, male, female, things like that, urban, rural. Okay, so you're starting to think about getting a representative amount of data from every possible grouping. So we're dividing population into characteristic-based groups and then selecting randomly from each group. So in our classroom example, we might take that whole classroom of, of students that we put into one hat. Now we're going to put a ninth grade hat, 10th grade hat, 11th grade hat, 12th grade hat, and then draw randomly from each hat to get our data points. So that would be stratified sampling. Now the last one, and the best, is quota-based sampling. So now what we do is it's the same as stratified, but now the amount of data from each group is in proportion to that group's proportion to the whole population. So for example, let's say we're sampling from all students in one class, but I have 70% boys and 30% girls. So if I do random, I might not get 70, 30 because that's random. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna divide it um, make sure that my data is 70% girls, 30% boys. I'm still going to do random from within there, but I'm going to grab more from the girls, less from the boys hat, just because there's more girls in my classroom than boys. So you can get very detailed with these two tasks in your sampling. And in reality, if you get called for a political poll, they're going to ask you a whole bunch of questions in the beginning to determine whether you fit the profile they're looking for in the sample. Because if you don't, they're just going to say, thank you very much, and they're going to move on, perhaps even without asking you the actual questions that they're interested in. Thanks for watching. 
Just before you go, make sure to write down any questions that you have so that you can bring them to our next class and get them answered. Also, remember that you can watch the video again if you want to deepen your understanding. Finally, if you enjoyed the video, please click like or subscribe.